Hello, everyone. Welcome to How to Read Chinese Poetry podcast. I'm Zhong Qicai, the program host. In this podcast program, my colleagues and I aim to introduce cutting-edge scholarship on Chinese poetry to a broad general audience. We will present 52 episodes covering the major poetic genres developed over China's long history. Each episode features close reading of one or more of the best-known Chinese poems, with an aim to illuminate their literary greatness and cultural significance. For all the discussed poems, Chinese texts, English translation, romanization, and brief notes are provided at our website, howtoreadchinesepoetry.com. By following the 52 episodes, listeners will gain a bird's eye view of the thematic, formal, and generic evolution of Chinese poetry from antiquity to the modern era. Instruct and delight is what we wish to accomplish in each talk. Without further ado, let's begin. Today, Professor Ninhauser will present his last episode. Let us welcome Professor Ninhauser. The Book of Poetry, A Pian to Zhou Dynasty Building. The final poem to be examined, Mian, Woven and Unbroken, it's a number 237, it's one of the odes in the Daya, our greater old section, depicts the founding of the Zhou Dynasty particularly the exploits of the grandfather of the first ruler, a man known to us as Gu Gong Danfu, a name that could be translated as the ancient Duke Danfu. There are other understandings, but we don't need to go into them. Uh, he moved the Zhou people who were originally inhabitants of a small state during the Shang Dynasty, away from the nomadic lifestyle that was their early tradition into the area in southern Shanxi, preparing the way for his grandson to conquer the Shang sometime around 1050 before the current era. The most detailed account of his life and rule can be found in the basic annals of Zhou, the uh, Zhou Banji, in Sima Qian's Shiji, Records of the Grand Scribe. And there we read, the ancient Duke Danfu again cultivated the enterprise to establish the Zhou dynasty, an enterprise of his ancestors, Hoji and Gongliu. He accumulated virtue and carried out justice. The people of the capital all supported him. When the Shunyu and the Rongdi attacked him, these two groups were non-Han peoples living in what is now modern Shanxi and Shanxi. When they attacked him, desiring to obtain wealth and goods, he gave it to them. When they attacked, desiring to obtain his territory and his people, the people were all angry and wanted to give battle. The ancient duke said, the people enthrone a lord in order that he will bring benefits to them. Now the reason the Rongdi are attacking and battling us is to take my territory and people. For the people to be with me or for them to be with the, those others, what is the difference? The people want to give battle because of me, but I cannot bear to allow people's fathers and sons to be killed in order to keep myself their Lord. Thus he left Bin, his capital, with his personal attendants crossed the Qi and Ju rivers, transversed Mount Liang, and stopped at the foot of Mount Qi. Every person in Bin, holding up their elders and carrying their children, again submitted themselves to Danfu at the foot of Mount Qi. When other neighboring states learned of the ancient duke's humanity, many indeed submitted to him. At this, 
the ancient Duke then abandoned the customs of the Romani, built city walls and residences, and settled the people in various cities. He appointed officials for the five offices. The people put all this to song and music to praise his virtue. So that's the Shirji text. The song they sang is this number 237 men, woven and unbroken. The poem is a long poem. It's primarily fu or exposition. So that is to say a narrative sort. And it, but it begins with a comparison. Woven. Woven and unbroken are the gourds, large and small, as the early life of our people. From the Du to the Qi came the ancient honorable Danfu. He dug shelters, he dug caves. They still did not have houses and homes. The ancient honorable Danfu on the next morning drove his horses. Leading them west along the banks of the river, he reached the foot of Mount Qi. Then with the woman Jiang, he came himself to look for places to dwell. The plain of Zhou was so fertile, even bitter celery was like honey. Then he began, then he divined, then he notched our tortoises. They read stay, they read its time. So he built homes there. And so he was content, and so he stayed. And so he created a left, and so he made a right. And so he set boundaries, and so he made territories. And so he dredged gullies, and so ordered the fields. From the west to the east, everywhere he then took charge of affairs. Then he summoned a master of construction. Then he summoned a master of labor, so that they could erect houses and homes. Their plume lines ruled straight. They lashed together planks as earthen molds to build an ancestral temple, reverent and respectful. Carrying the earth in crowds and multitudes, throwing it into molds with clamors and shouts, raising walls with a pounding beat, smoothing them with a scraping sound. One hundred walls rose up together. The beating of the work drums could not keep up. So he created the outer gates soaring, soaring the gates so high. So he erected the palace gate, the palace gate so grand. So he erected a great earthen shrine whereby to parade the wrong captives. Though over time he could not stop the enemy's wrath, still they did no harm to our reputation. He thinned the oaks, he cleared the roads, he frightened away the coon barbarians. Ah, how they panted in exhaustion. To cause the Yu and the Roy to pledge peace, King Wen quickened their yielding natures. I say he brought those estranged to follow him. I say he drew those from front and back to him. I say he caused those with petitions to rush to him. I say he brought his defamers to his defense. Woven and unbroken the gourds, large and small. Like the early life of our people, from the Du to the Qi rivers came the ancient Duke Danfu. He dug shelters, he dug caves. They still did not have houses and homes. So here in this first stanza, the poem begins to, with the Xing, or effective image, where the long stems of the gourds are compared to the long history of the Zhou people. Then it describes their journey in the next stanza. The ancient Duke Danfu drove his horses as dawn first came, leading them west along the banks of the river. He reached the foot of Mount Xi. Then with the woman Jiang, he came to himself to look for places to dwell. The woman Jiang here is his wife, a daughter of a neighboring state uh, through, and through this marriage, it allowed him an alliance uh, with a, a small uh, nearby state and also to start to have the kind of influence that he wanted to have uh, between these smaller states and the Zhou 
before the Shang could be overthrown. And the next stanza describes uh, what he found when he uh, arrived at Mount Xi. The plain of Zhou was so fertile, even bitter celery was like honey. Then he began, then he divined. Then he notched our tortoises. They read, stay. They read, it's time. So he built homes there. So as you may know, divination at this time was done by heating tortoise shells and then inserting hot metal rods in holes in tortoise shells and then reading or interpreting the cracks. So here the cracks indicate that they should stay and that it's time to stop their journey. The next stanza. And so he was content and so he stayed. And so he set boundaries and so he made territories. And so he dredged gullies and so ordered the fields from the west to the east. Everywhere he then took charge of affairs. That is, he set up the lands for his people. Then he summoned a master of construction. Then he summoned a master of labor so that they could erect house and homes. Their plumb lines ruled straight. They lashed together planks as earthen molds to build an ancestral temple, reverent and respectful. After building homes and setting up boundaries between fields, he turned to the dynasty build by first constructing a temple to his Joe ancestors so that they would support his efforts. And the next stanza reads, uh, and the next few stanzas, I don't think you need any commentary in between. So I'll just read to the end. Carrying the earth in crowds and multitudes, throwing it into molds with clamors and shouts, raising walls with a pounding beat, smoothing them with a scraping sound. 100 walls rose up together. The beating of the work drums could not keep up. So he created the outer gate soaring, soaring the outer gate so high. So he erected the palace gate, the palace gate so grand. So he erected the, a great earthen shrine, whereby to parade the room captives. Though over time he could not stop the enemy's wrath, still they did no harm to our reputation. He thinned the oaks, he cleared the roads, he frightened away the Kun barbarians. Ah, how they panted in exhaustion. Then the final stanza. To cause the Yu and the Rei to pledge peace, or maybe to cause Yu and Rei, the states of Yu and Rei. King Wen quickened their yielding natures. I say he brought those estranged to follow him. I say he drew those from the front and back to him. I say he caused those with petitions to rush to him. I say he brought his defamers to his defense. The last stanza changes the subject from the ancient Du Danfu to his grandson, Chang, who became King Wan of Zhou, thus the founder of the Zhou dynasty. This final section, which contains seven lines rather than six, could be a later interpolation, a later addition, added in order to help this poem, Mian, fit into the epic-like account of King Wan, which dominates most of the poems in the greater odes section. Uh, it's a puzzling last stanza, exactly uh, what the relationship between Yu and Rei are. These two little states is a subject of much commentary that we don't need to go into here. Although not a highly literary piece, this long poem evinces careful attention to sound patterns. The third through fifth stanza, lines that could be considered an account of the preparations for the building of Danfu's new capital, are joined by words which all rhyme to the same rhyme category. The rhyme words in the following sixth stanza in which the sounds of construction reverberate, were also skillfully chosen, 
each ending in this sonorous nasal, perhaps suggesting the tempo of pounding earth into walls. All this also allowing the lengthy poem to be more easily memorized, since this was a poem about uh, dynastic creation. Undoubtedly, anyone at the Joe Court would have to know this uh, poem, I think, by heart. The poems which we have read should provide an introduction to the imagery and prosody of this classical anthology. The various themes and even the language helped shape countless later works and as noted above, served as a source for allusion down to modern times. Many of the poems in the Book of Poetry remain paradoxically alive for the modern reader because of the simplistic beauty of their imagery juxtaposed to the complexity, often the obscurity, of their message. Let us thank Professor Nienhauser for such a stimulating talk. This talk concludes his topic, The Fountainhead of Chinese Poetry, The Book of Poetry. To learn more from Professor Inhauser on this topic, you may read his chapter on the Book of Poetry in our source book, How to Read Chinese Poetry, a Guided Anthology. Next week, we will get started on the topic, The Book of Poetry and Diplomacy. Professor Y. Yi Li of Harvard University will be our guest host. I hope you enjoyed the talk. Let us relax and listen to a reading of the poem in Mandarin. Shi Jing, Da Ya, Mian, Mian Mian Gua Die, Ming Zhi Chu Sheng. 自土卒期，古公胆腐，逃赴逃学，未有家室。古公胆腐，来朝走马，率西水浒，至于旗下。原籍江女，欲来续语。周元五五，锦图如仪，原始元谋，元气我归。曰止曰时，注视于兹。乃谓乃止，乃左乃右，乃将乃礼，乃宣乃母。自西卒东，周元直事，乃昭司空，乃昭司徒，必立世家。其绳则直，缩板以载，坐庙奕奕。修之仍仍。夺之轰轰，柱之噔噔，削楼平平，白堵皆兴，高谷浮盛，乃立高门，高门有炕，乃立应门，应门锵锵，乃立冢舍，容丑幽行，四不舔绝韵，亦不损绝问，坐御把矣，行道对矣，坤仪退矣。为其会矣。余瑞至绝城，文王贵绝生。预曰有叔父，预曰有先后，预曰有奔奏，预曰有御武。